just want to confirm that you can see my slides and hear me. Is that all OK? Yes. Good. So so we talk, I think, about an important problem. People get sick. They um, need a medical treatment and then you hope for a better outcome. And the role of medical science is to inform um, medical treatments and actions of the medical system. And that's a complicated process to do research and then get it published. But publishers play an important role in um, uh, in getting the medical science out in the public domain. So for myself at least, but I think for many of us, we have long assumed that data submitting to medical journals are largely true. But maybe medical science was or is still as the Olympic Games, um, but then without any doping checks. So this would not be so important if it would count for a few number of studies, but I'm afraid that at least in my field, it is a large problem. I will be short about that because of time, but this is an example of a meat analysis that we did with individual data. So by doing the process of individual data and meta analysis, we went down from 49 to 31 studies. So we lost 18 studies of people who didn't share data. And Europe and the US and also Australia did pretty good in almost everybody shared data. But the problem was in Egypt um, and the Middle East where only a small minority of people shared data. So others have, have demonstrated this too. Um, I think many in the um, in the forum are familiar with the work of John Carlyle, anesthesiologist, who at, at, in the journal Anesthesia assesses data when they come in for a publication, and he aims that that the number of problematic data, depending on the country of origin, um, is somewhere between uh, 30 and 70 percent. And John Yonanides, based on that um, um, estimates that it could be hundreds of thousands of randomized clinical trials. Um, and I, I forgot to say that, but I'm specifically focused on randomized clinical trials because they are the ones that inform um, our practice. And, and my estimate is that that 30 percent of the randomized clinical trials in my field, women's health, are fabricated or have false data. So what do we do about it? Um, COPE, uh, the Committee of Publication Ethics, has a series of standards and guidelines, and one of them is how to handle post-publication uh, critiques. Again, I will not go into detail. We'll probably do that later in the session. And again, the publishers play an important role of that. What I will do now is I give two examples where I think I will demonstrate that the current system doesn't work. This is a paper published by Dr. Stalaman in 2019. It's a randomized clinical trial, 550 uh, women divided in three groups. And um, there is a lot to say about this paper. So my colleague George Sade and I did that in a letter to the editor where we asked, well, is this really possible? Can you really have that many patients? Is it actually ethical to have no treatment? Um, and while the letter was answered to our surprise, there came a second paper from the same group. So, so the second author from the first paper, Dr. Redick, comes back as the first author in, 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 in this paper a year later. And it's almost the same trial with, with two of the three arms, the same, same sample size to be run in the, in the same center. But you almost cannot believe that that is true. And then to be completely convinced, if you look into the tables of the first on the top and the second article for the mother, left and the right, then the red squares indicate exactly the same numbers, which is impossible to happen by chance. And then to be completely convinced, if you look into these tables, these are all even numbers. That also doesn't happen by chance if you um, if you uh, uh, do studies like that. So these papers now have an expression of concern, but that took two years for each of the papers. And here is the problem, the papers are already cited. So this is an influential meta-analysis on how to treat women with hypertension in pregnancy, which is 
which is cause of death number two in the world among pregnant women. And there are a substantial number of data in that meta-analysis wrong. So we wrote to the editor in the journal and we said, well, um, is this not equal to the Boeing 737 MAX, where they knew the software was wrong, but they didn't take any uh, action. And the journal until today says, we will wait uh, determination uh, until uh, the original journals have investigated. So part of that investigation is going back to the uh, institutes itself. This is a letter from Manufia University where these two uh, studies come from. And, and the university leadership says that data are only kept for more for maximum two years, which I think is just a response on all the problematic papers they have. One of the co-signees, Professor Kandil, is a fabricator himself. So if you're not convinced, this is more work from Dr. Rezek. So a first paper and a second paper, same journals. Look at the, at the uh, numbers that are the same. So the 2273 becomes a 2973. A one for one standard deviation is the same. These are not the same patient series. It's different um, uh, uh, patient series uh, and different um, uh, uh, diseases. So I have no doubt that, that, that this work is fabricated. About the even numbers, this is the number of papers that this author, Dr. Rezek, has published with only even numbers, 20 studies, right? So, so we are sure that this is um, um, uh, that this is uh, 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 problematic. Twelve papers of this uh, author have been um, uh, uh, retracted until now. This is an overview of the of the studies that he has done on these non-randomized studies. So each blue. Um, a, a dot is a moment of submission, and what you can actually see, he just makes up one study after the other and claims that it's all done in the past. One other interesting thing, they all start almost at the same time. And also, and a large majority runs for exactly a year. And, and I'm even afraid that all the work of this university, the Department of ONG, is fabricated. So this is their track record in PubMed. Until 2014, no studies at all. And suddenly they do 27 a year. 25 of these studies are randomized clinical trials. So, so what is the reaction of the academic community uh, on that and the publishing community? We wrote um, an, a letter uh, or, an, or an, an article actually where we analyzed the work of Dr. Rezek and, and flagged all these issues that I just showed and sent it to our guys of obstetrics gynecology. It was accepted for publication after peer review and then the editor came back to us and said Springer doesn't want us to publish it because it's a risk for the editor, for us as authors, uh, the journal and the publisher, and there are other ways to, to get this in the public domain. Well, I disagree with it because it takes all much too long and they also asked us not to share that with others, but of course I'm not going to do that. Um, and this comes from COPE. So I have made on the formal route and concern about these papers with COPE. And COPE um, uh, uh, this week comes back with a report where the publisher Taylor and Francis says this case has been on hold for several months. Um, as the journal editor stepped down several months ago, and we are waiting for the statistical editor uh, to make an assessment. Well, I, I really am stunned. I'm sorry to say it, that for a paper like this, you need years to get an uh, uh, assessment. So the second example, um, uh, this is work of, of uh, Dr. Torki. Um, here we got our assessment uh, published in the public domain. Dr. Torki has published about 14 studies. Here are his RCTs. Um, I think they are problematic. Um, Two and this week uh, a third one um, has been retracted. This this paper took one and a half years to get retracted. And again, just as Resic, these are all even data. So you can see within 15 minutes that this paper cannot be true. So what happened here is that because we got our data in the public domain, somebody from yeah. Egypt contacted us 
and said, well, I can tell you actually the background of how Dr. Torki works. He takes a medical thesis from a student and then translate this into an, an RCT. And here is the proof of that. So I'm going to show you now quickly all the original thesis and then the published article. And the problem is they are not a reflection of that work, but the data between all these papers change. So that is 100% proof of fabrication also. And this information is with all the editors and publishers since December 2022. So almost half a year uh, ago now. This is the message from um, uh, an editor who writes to me in December 2022. Confidentially, we will retract one of these papers. Please don't share it. Um, the publisher is a bit slow. Um, but until now, it is still not retracted. And for Taylor and Francis, this is not the editor where you think it is that I communicate with. This comes from another editor. This is another message from January that papers will be retracted. Nothing of this decision, this decision is in the, in the um, uh, public domain. And here is the problem. I do the meta-analysis for fertility and sterility. This is my email box yesterday with a request to assess a meta-analysis on this topic where the authors conclude that it works. And here is a paper of Dr. Torki amid of all other uh, uh, problematic papers. So the material that I just showed ended up into meta-analysis. This is a meta-analysis on how to treat transatlantic acid in the prevention of postpartum hemorrhage, bleeding um, um, at the end of delivery, the main cause of women dying in the world during our forum seven women will die because of this disease based on the literature you would estimate that txa is a fantastic treatment with a relative risk of 0.37 again a study of dr torki in it but here is the big randomized clinical trial from from a month ago it doesn't work at all so we are just misinforming the world around us a final example this is the lancet of last week who spends a lot of space on how to protect the small vulnerable newborns and their associated outcomes uh, with evidence-based antenatal interventions. Uh, they do that by um, uh, citing meta-analysis and these meta-analysis are misinformed by all the fabricated papers. So I have already identified six fabricated papers that misinform um, the Lancet series uh, of this week. Um, so that is really the problem that I have. I, I, I've, I'm working hard on this. I've read um, more than 900 issues of, of which a minority have been uh, uh, addressed. Um, I've also gone to COPE. COPE this week has said for the material that I just showed, upon consideration of the concerns and the members' response, the Facilitation and Integrity Subcommittee of COPE considers that the journals followed an adequate process to follow up concerns raised under their attention. Well, I don't think so. It's not the individuals that don't work, it's the system that is not working. This is also from two weeks ago, parliamentary inquiry in the UK, who says that the process of retraction did not take more than two months. I've been interviewed by this um, in uh, The Economist recently, and um, um, uh, th th there was an enormous amount of uh, response from the public, and people said it's very strange that this has to come from outside medicine to solve it. So I go back to the fish where I started. If you run a grocery, you shouldn't sell rotten tomatoes. If you sell fish, you should make sure that your fish is fresh. And if you publish medical science, you should be sure that at least it is true. Practical recommendations. Be much more transparent. Don't me as a complainant. Exclude me from the material that you're session. Organize the investigation around the work of one author over multiple publishers. That's not happening. If a single author has more than five retracted papers with fabricated data, the burden of proof should be with the author and publish expressions of concern at least 
much faster. So conclusions. Um, first, before I forget, Taylor and Francis, Sabina and Julia, who are both here, should be commended for making important steps and joining this forum. And I'm not cynical here because Taylor and Francis, what I showed, actually is the publishers that make the most progress of it. Elsevier is completely nowhere. The COPE system for post publication assessment does not work. The lack of response from the majority of the academic community is of great concern. And don't come to me with the, with the story that it's also difficult because it's not. The material that I've just showed you is very, very clearly fabricated. Everyone can see that and we should not accept this to be in the public domain any longer. Thank you. Thanks very much, Ben. Thank you. And Sabine. Now, yes, actually, well, thanks, Ben. We'll, we'll hand over to Sabina. Yeah, I should Thank quick, quickly. Sh no, no, I don't. Think you can unshare. Yeah. Just make sure you don't leave by accident. Yeah. Always worried about that with Teams. So, okay. Sabina. Thank you Thank very you. much. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, can you see my slides? Yes. Excellent. Great. Thank you. And thank you, Ben, for um, for your presentation just now. And thanks to Jenny for inviting me to give the publisher's perspective. So um, <clears throat> I'm not going to discuss specific papers here. I'm going to give you an overall idea about how we at Ten Francis work on the kind of <clears throat> investigations that are required when it comes to ethics or integrity concerns. So I lead the publishing ethics and integrity team and my colleague Julia is here on the call today as well. So just to start with, who are we? Um, so we're a team that sits across all of the Taylor Francis group journals. So that includes the Dub Press journals and F1000 as well. So that's all of the disciplines and approximately 3000 journals. And it's a big mix, a big mix of topics, a big mix of models, you have subscription journals, open access journals, hybrid journals, um, and of course F1000, which is a fully um, post-publication peer review as well. Um, but we get issues all across this. Um, and the reason why our team sits in a way independently of the journals is so that we can work more objectively on ethics and integrity concerns. So that basically means that we don't have um, those very, very close relationships with, for example, editors or the editorial board in case there's some implications there as well. It allows us to take a step back and do the investigation as objectively as possible. Um, but it also more importantly helps us to keep abreast of trends. So a lot of the issues that Ben has been talking about and also with paper mills are uh, usually spotted when you see it as trends occurring across different journals and even different disciplines. And I've listed there some of the other work that we do, but I'm not going to go into that today um, because of lack of time. Um, so what do we see? Um, well, a lot of what Ben had discussed is about data issues, data, uh, potential data fabrication or falsification, but there's a lot of other issues that we come across in all shapes and sizes, and I'm sure any publishers on, on the call uh, will be able to relate to many of these. I've only listed here the most common types, but what we've been seeing um, over the last few years is an increase in what we would describe as intentional misconduct. So things like authorship disputes, um, plagiarism concerns even, um, incomplete computing interests could can often be a mix of unintentional misconduct or intentional. But what we're seeing more and more of are the data misrepresentation or bias reporting or the data fabrication or falsification that Ben was talking about. And that as well is in all of the disciplines. It's not just in medicine, it's even in uh, social sciences as well. And of course, concerns around image manipulation or stock images, unethical research. And then of course, the, the that um, agents like paper mills or predatory author services, identity theft is of an increasing concern as there are compromised special issues and supplements as well as stakeholders or suppliers. So it's a really big mix of issues that we're dealing with and always trying to get to the bottom of what is the actual truth in any kind of concern that is raised. So when we're handling an ethics investigation, these are our key principles that we uh, the, the ethics team um, 
try to adhere to. Um, I'm, again, I'm not going to go into all of this due to lack of time and it's, I think, self-explanatory. But one of the key things is making sure that we're doing our due diligence at every step. And it's it's why we want a response from all parties. So from the complainant as well as the authors and also the editors. So in the ethics team, when a case becomes complex or large or is part, or is part of a batch, then the ethics team actually takes it on. So, so we then drive that investigation and consult with the editor rather than asking the editor to drive that investigation. And that's so that, again, we can ensure that we're being consistent, but also we're doing those key due diligence steps um, all throughout. Because one of the things we don't want to happen is that the investigation becomes compromised. And when that happens, then it kind of undoes any kind of work that we might have put into it in the first place. So I'm showing you here um, the process of our investigations for a typical case. This, this doesn't necessarily represent what we would do for paper mills, and it doesn't necessarily represent what we would do for the kinds of batch cases that Ben has been presenting as well, because we would class those as the complex batch cases. But this gives you the general impression of the kinds of steps that we would take. So first of all, the concern can come from absolutely any direction at all. It can come from um, whistleblowers, it can come internally, it can come from editors, it can come from our own audits, it can come from the institutions, um, it can come at any stage. So it can come during the submission or peer review process, it can come at the production process, it can also come after publication. So one of the first things my team will do is assess the nature of the concern. Now, if it's quite straightforward, we generally don't see it. So if, if it's a straightforward, um, I mean, are any ethics cases straightforward? Well, thankfully some are. Um, so a straightforward plagiarism case or authorship dispute where it's quite clear the steps that we need to take, there's clear cope guidance on that. That's something that the editorial team or the editors can handle themselves and they don't necessarily bring that to us. But as soon as it becomes quite complex or they're not sure what to do, it will get escalated to our team. And then we, we triage it. So we're looking at, is it a pre-publication concern or a post-publication concern? What's the actual content of the manuscript? So as Ben was talking about, things like clinical trials are of the highest priority because of the real world consequences of publishing um, inaccurate content um, according to that. So where, where we do look at the level of risk as well and prioritise according to that. And then we don't just look at the concern raised, it's then a reason for us to look at everything else surrounding the article. So even if nothing else has been raised about the research ethics standards there or other integrity concerns, we will still actually go through an assessment, including looking at the handling of the article as well because sometimes concerns can get raised at that level, in particular when it comes to paper mills. Sometimes we can see this peer review manipulation going on as well. So we look at the entire thing and then we follow certain steps. Again, I won't go into this in detail here, but this will vary according to if it's published or not. If it's not published, that's obviously a preference because then we can place it on hold and take all the steps without doing any damage by publishing something that shouldn't have been but if it has been published, then we need to, again, assess level of risk. Should there be an expression of concern there? Um, keeping in mind an expression of concern is a permanent notice. So that is something we need to consider carefully as well. And then we go through the steps of contacting the authors and asking for a response or asking for information. Um, often the institution is involved as well. And then assessing the, the files that they provide in response to our questions. And those steps, steps four to five, can take time. It can take much longer than any of us would like for a variety of reasons. Um, and then the steps that we would take after that would really depend on whether or not the concerns have been addressed. So when we look at um, the concerns that have been raised to our team, um, what we see year on year is the, the same five types of cases come up um, year on year. The volume has increased. So just to give you some context, um, when I took on this role, that was in May 2019, so exactly a year ago, um, exactly how many, four years ago now. And at that time, the number of cases that had come to the team were 175 cases. 
this year, so far, just from January until May, we've got over 1,400 cases. Uh, so it, it's just absolutely ballooning for a variety of reasons. And it's not just paper mills, and it's not just the types of cases that um, Ben has showed us as well. But what we do see is more than half of those cases <coughs> that get raised um, involve concerns around data. And when I say data, I mean images as well as any types of qualitative data as well, because sometimes it's about surveys or interviews um, and also clinical trial data, like Ben had mentioned as well. Um, <clears throat> that has always been one of the biggest um, issues, but it's actually increasingly becoming more and more of an issue, again, for a variety of reasons. And these do take time to investigate because it's not always something we can just see, you know, with our eyes. If, if it's a manipulated image and we can see that, then fair enough, that's actually quite straightforward for us to deal with. But it's unfortunately not always the case, and it does require us going back and forth with the authors and the institution, which does slow things down. And of course, that is something that we want to get faster at. So dealing with data and image integrity concerns specifically, these are the things that we're considering. It's not an exhaustive list. This is just gives you a, a, a basic insight. So one of the first things we're trying to assess is, is this deliberate or unintentional? So is it plausible that it could be unintentional, that there's a plausibility that we're looking at there as well? And also, if there is an error in with the data or the image, or if, if they've uploaded the wrong image, for example, or if that's what they say, how much does that actually affect the article's conclusion? So we're kind of trying to weigh up the impact that has, because that will help inform whether or not this needs to end up in a retraction or so on and so forth. And then also, are there any competing interests that haven't been declared? So are there reasons why this problem might exist? And then we think of the what, what's the type of data we're talking about? It comes in all shapes and sizes, as I'm sure you all know. Um, is it sensitive? Because if it is a sensitive data set, then we need to work with the authors for them to give it to us in a responsible way and get that assessed in a responsible way as well. And when we're asking authors for the raw data, we also need to know what do we expect that raw data to look like? Because especially when we work with um, authors who are unfortunately being fraudulent, they do send us lots of files that, and they try to make it look like raw data, but if you look at it closely, you can tell it's not. Um, so that's something we need to keep in mind as well, that what kind of thing are we expecting? And then when it comes to the investigation, um, we're thinking about is, do we need to bring in up further expertise? So do we need to bring in a statistical referee, for example? Um, has this flagged any other concerns? Do we need to look at all of the papers from this author group? or? all of the papers in this journal, or all of the papers in this topic. So, because sometimes one can lead to many um, if we're then spotting a trend. And do we need specific tools um, for this as well? And then with the, the final steps um, are often influenced by the author response. Even if they don't respond, we have to try and give them, uh, you know, the option to respond to us. Um, and do we have sufficient information to make a decision? And then the bit that does slow us down quite a bit is the production schedule. If we do have a post-publication notice, like a retraction to post, unfortunately, we <clears throat> are hampered somewhat by technology on our side. There are some other publishers that are much faster as, as Dove Press, but that is something we are working with our colleagues on to try and help speed that up. Um, when it does come to post-publication notices, there's four main types that we publish. So the, the correction, retraction, expression of concern, or a removal, which is quite rare. Um, the one thing though, is that these all take far longer than we would like um, for a variety of reasons, even when we've got to the point of drafting it. Um, but that is something that hopefully, you know, working with others across the industry, including COPE, we can get to, get to do this much more faster going forwards. Um, but there are ongoing challenges and, Again, I'm not going to read these all out to you, and I don't think these will be a surprise to any of you as well. But the ongoing challenges, there are some factors we ha we can't control. Like we can we can attempt to contact all the authors, but if they're not responding or they're being evasive, it does unfortunately slow things down. And it's the same with the institution. If the institutions are non-responsive, 
and that's if you even figure out who to contact at the institution as well. It's not always clear. Um, and there's an ever increasing volume of concern. So it is it is a challenge. I mean, I'll be really open about that. I mean, we're a you know a fairly moderate sized team. There's eight of us in the team, but it's a real challenge to keep up with the volume of concerns that are coming in every day without the appropriate technology and tools um, to help us with that, which is a bit of a nod to, I guess, what Yoris will be talking about. But before I hand over to Yoris, there are some um, sort of <clears throat> activities that we're involved in. Um, so COPE and STM had commissioned a research um, project of, uh, I think it's about last year, to take a really deeper dive into paper mills to understand what they are. And we contributed to that as well, which was a really important body of work to help us understand and characterise paper mills. And then more recently, we worked with COPE on um, enhancing some of the guidance around systematic manipulation. Uh, we kind of refer to paper mill cases, but really it's about big batch cases. And what this guidance is about is not necessarily not not necessarily having to deal with the paper on a case by case basis, actually empowering editors and editorial teams to work on them as a batch level and take batch level actions, which actually will speed things up. And then we're trialing tools. We, we're using image twin and prefig. We're also um, trialing the, um, when, when possible, the problematic paper screener to see if we can detect tortured phrases. And of course, we're involved in the uh, work that Yoris and his team have been driving quite important work on the STM Integrity Hub. Um, and other actions are all around the continuous review of policies and processes. I, I cannot emphasize enough um, how important that is for us and how much effort we put into that, as well as this, as well as the knowledge sharing across the industry, because actually sharing with each other what trends we're seeing and what red flags we're seeing and how we can create um, guidance best practice is extremely important. We've really um, upped the kind of checks and processes that happens at the journal level as well, including the kind of training that we're offering for editors, reviewers and authors as well. And where we can, like taking part in collaborations with key stakeholders across the industry, because ultimately we, we have to just have to get to this point of fostering good publishing practices from authors all over the world because we all have been working on a trust-based system up until now which has I guess led to this. So that's it from me. 